Welcome to Mini Scandals, the series where we dive into the scandals, drama and interesting stories that make up the world's hobbies, niches and interests. In the early 2000s, kids who yearned for an edgier, more mature version of Pokemon found themselves turning to Digimon, Newgrounds parodies where Pikachu smokes weed and of course, Yu-Gi-Oh. Based on the Japanese manga of the same name, Yu-Gi-Oh has since special summoned a multimedia empire featuring multiple spin-off manga, anime series, and the reason you're probably here, well, besides the need to distract yourself from your own mortality, the trading card game. Initially designed to give school bullies something new to steal, the trading card game has since gone to stand alongside titans such as Magic the Gathering and the Pokemon TCG. But this success has activated more than a few trap cards. It's time to do Discuss Yu-Gi-Oh! Scandals and Drama England has its football riots, America has people performing WWE moves over a new toaster oven on Black Friday, but how do you get the normally orderly and respectful Japanese people to kick up a fuss? Why you withhold a children's card game from them of course. Long before Yu-Gi-Oh sailed the seven seas and made its way to the west, it was taking Japan by storm. In 1999, Konami scheduled the Yu-Gi-Oh Duel Monsters Legend Tournament to be held at the Tokyo Dome, a stadium that regularly hosts sporting events, concerts and apparently card game tournaments. After inviting the players who would be competing in the tournament, Konami opened up the invitation to anyone who had purchased that week's Shonen Jump magazine, the popular publication which printed the Yu-Gi-Oh manga. While I'm sure just the mere idea of a stadium full of men with pit stains playing Yu-Gi-Oh would have drawn a massive crowd on its own, Konami decided to seal the deal by announcing that they would be selling a premium pack of cards that would be unobtainable anywhere else. For this to really make sense, I first need to explain the environment that Yu-Gi-Oh was in at the time, probably as a way to squeeze a quick buck out of the game they probably thought was in the middle of its 15 seconds of fame. Konami would often bundle powerful promo cards with Yu-Gi-Oh brand video games, guidebooks and ride on lawn mowers, all of which costed significantly more than your standard pack of cards. Keep in mind, all of these promo cards were completely tournament legal, meaning anyone looking to get a competitive edge would either have to buy these products exclusively for the promos or buy them off someone who did. Even that might not be enough however, as some of the promo cards were randomised on top of it all, meaning you could shell out for a full price video game only to get the Yu-Gi-Oh equivalent of a stick of gum and two stray pubes. The power level of these promo cards was so much higher than the normally available ones that the early meta of the game revolved around a deck type called Good Stuff which was literally just a hodgepodge of whatever cards had the highest numbers on them with no real strategy, putting the pros on the same level as the 10 year olds playing during recess. So the idea of showing up to a tournament that you weren't even competing in just to nab an exclusive pack of cards that might give you a competitive edge wasn't as ridiculous as that might sound today. But even still, Konami severely underestimated just how enticing this was. The day rolls around and the Tokyo Dome, a venue used to hosting the likes of Michael Jackson, was considerably unprepared for the 55,000 Yu-Gi-Oh players who descended upon the stadium. Of these 55,000, only 45,000 made it in before the stadium reached its capacity, with the other 10,000 left to ponder the heart of the cards outside. Those who made it inside didn't fare much better as the vendor for the premium booster was considerably understocked for the amount of attendees. You didn't hear incorrectly either, I said vendor, not vendors, and the poor stall quickly found itself overrun by a crowd of people whose patience was wearing thinner by the minute. Unsure of how best to handle the mounting tensions, organisers postponed the sale of the cards by a few hours before deciding to cancel the sale of the packs altogether. Having waited in line for hours on a hot summer's day, only to suffer from a case of Blue Bull's White Dragon, the crowd began to become belligerent, shouting at the staff and refusing to leave. Riot police were called in to duel the players and two people were taken to the hospital while others were treated with minor injuries. The tournament, aka the whole reason this thing was even happening, didn't make it past the second qualifying round before organisers decided to can it due to the commotion. Konami later tried to make amends for the people who showed up wanting a premium pack 
and set up a clunky mail order system that required you to submit proof you had attended on the day, either in the form of tickets or hospital gowns. Add location. <laughs> The other prince escaped years ago. Unfortunately, I'm one of the two out of three men who have suffered from male pattern baldness before the age of 35. Hey Rapunzel mate, you coming down? So there's no chance my current here will get me out of this tower. Mirror mirror over there. However do I dare to solve this problem of my... Uh, balding. Hi, ah! I'm Pete you Blover, here to talk to you about kids. Worry no more, gentle prince. With Keeps, you're given a clinically proven and research-backed treatment that can not only stop the loss of hair, but promote strong, healthy hair growth as well. You won't even need to leave the tower. Keeps utilizes physicians to create a treatment plan specifically for you, delivered direct to you. No need to see your local plague doctors and about half the cost as well. Sign oh. up now. Oh, do I? Oh, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, no, nah, yeah, no, nah, no, nah, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. On. Yep. It's that easy. Not only that, but you have a 24-7 connection to your prescribing doctor should you ever have any queries. Man, I don't know. It'll probably grow back. Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get 50% off your first order, go to keeps.com slash mini kudos or click the link in the description below. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash mini kudos. <sighs> okay, I'm finally ready. Here goes nothing. Thanks, Keeps. Now, while most of these scandals are centered around the card game itself, it'd be remiss of me to not mention the reason I'm sure any of you even know what Yu-Gi-Oh is in the first place. The anime. Having learned from the 20 minute commercials of the 80s, such as Transformers and G.I. Joe Mama, Yu-Gi-Oh! hoped to one-up its predecessors by adding in the addictive factor of gambling and advertising kids' trading card booster packs. While content to sell the dopamine hit of proto loot boxes to the impressionable youth, 4Kids, the company behind the western localization of the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, were much more conservative when it came to the show's risque content. The name 4Kids is infamous amongst anime fans, second only to Sunlight and Talking to Girls Over 18. In order to localize their shows from Japan, 4Kids took a slapdash approach that involved removing any realistic violence, with punches thrown by characters edited and redubbed to just be a light shove, as well as the complete removal of guns, which gave us the infamous threatening point scene. While removing guns from a show for American audiences is like removing giant deadly spiders from a show for Australian audiences, it does make some small sense that the prevalence of firearms in American households might have made it more likely for kids to recreate these scenes compared to their lead-starved Japanese equivalents. 4Kids was also notorious for its removal of anything remotely sexual. Although depending on who you ask, some agree that maybe Japan went a bit hard. No pun intended. A significant number of female character designs were altered to have less revealing clothing, show less cleavage, and in some cases, flat out reduction of the bust size of some of their women. In the name of fairness, they also applied the same treatment to some of the male characters, covering up excessive exposed skin, although their bust size appears unchanged. While you could argue that these changes were just made to appease the stuffy TV networks that 4Kids was shopping the show around to, they also found their way into the real life card game published by Upper Deck and Konami, and a significant number of cards that were never in the show also found themselves censored. Finally. Any and all references to religion or the occult were replaced with decidedly more secular versions. Even generic terms like hell or faith used in the names of monsters or attacks. One of Yugi's most famous cards, the Dark Magician, was actually named the Black Magician in Japanese, but 4Kids deemed the occult connotation of black magic to be offensive to western sensibilities. Though given what we've seen in other mini scandals videos, changing this probably wasn't the dumbest idea. This aversion to religion and violence also saw the creation of one of Yu-Gi-Oh's iconic concepts, 
the Shadow Realm. Death is a common occurrence in the Japanese version of the show, but four kids felt that American children were already reminded of their own mortality whenever they heard someone play pumped up kicks at school, and invented the Shadow Realm as a cheeky way around this. Anytime a character would die in the Japanese version, they were sent to the Shadow Realm in the Western one, which is described as a hell-like realm of perpetual suffering, which is somehow better than just saying they died. This resulted in some ridiculous scenarios, such as the duel that takes place atop the skyscraper in Domino City, where panels of glass were rigged to explode should the player standing on them lose the game. In the Japanese dub, they would simply fall to their deaths, but in the English dub, they would fall into portals to the Shadow Realm? Makes you wonder why they spent all that time and money to reanimate the scenes with the guns when they could have just had the characters say they were shooting Shadow Realm bullets. <laughs> Laws are the only thing that separates man from beast, and one look at Yu-Gi-Oh's official ruling will prove just how fine that line really is. Now, okay, in my Magic the Gathering video I might have lent into the smell jokes a, a little bit too much, but I can assure you these all came from a place of sincerity. Namely, I've played against some people who smell god awful. <laughs> A lack of personal hygiene is apparently consistent amongst people who collect small cardboard rectangles, but Yu-Gi-Oh decided to step it up by officially ruling it illegal to smell like roast beef. In an update to the official tournament rules from April 2019, the policy reads, You are expected to be clean when you enter a tournament. Persons who neglect self-care to the point that they are negatively impacting the tournament may be asked to correct the issue in order to continue in the event. Honestly, this is a pretty based and soap pilled ruling, essentially giving judges the ability to write someone up should they smell like a Smash Bros tournament in a durian farm. Given how competitive some of these players can get, I wouldn't be surprised if at least one fucking troglodyte aimed to smell as bad as possible in order to throw their opponent off and give themselves the edge. After all, sitting across from someone with a repugnant odour is the nasal equivalent of someone blasting an air horn in your ear. And trying to concentrate on a complicated card game on top of that? I mean, that takes talent. Hygiene was once again the focal point of a ruling around the unique promo card named Yujo Friendship. This spell has the effect where you offer your opponent a handshake, and if they accept, each player's life points become half the combined life points of both players. You can also reveal the Unity card from your hand in order to force your opponent to agree to the handshake. Now take one trip to a public bathroom and count how many dudes go from the pisser directly to the door without washing their hands to see why they had to change the ruling on this card. Except don't really because that'd be kind of weird. The current ruling on Yujo Friendship states that you don't have to physically shake your opponent's hand, just consent to the idea of a handshake, which is weirdly philosophical. This ruling happened years before the pandemic and while Yujo Friendship isn't a card that sees a ton of tournament play, it's still one of the few rulings I can think of that stop you from reducing your actual life points to zero. If you thought my Kiwi accent talking about cutting a dick in my Magic the Gathering video sounded suspicious, now I get to talk about a guy with a really, really long deck instead. You'd think most card games would have some manner of maximum deck size, right? Magic the Gathering requires you to be able to shuffle your deck unassisted, Pokemon's players can't count above 10, but for a good chunk of Yu-Gi-Oh's life, there was no rules about how long your deck can be, staunchly defying the notion that Germans don't have a sense of humour. Two of our later hosing loving lads entered a deck in the 2007 Yu-Gi-Oh German Nationals in Hanover, Germany that was, drumroll please, 2,222 cards. The deck was piloted by Mike Shway on the right, with the 1.2 meter acrylic deck box built by his friend Tobias Hainer on the left. Mike was an official Yu-Gi-Oh judge, which explains how he knew this whole thing would be tournament legal, but doesn't really explain why anyone would bother going through this whole ordeal. Some people theorised it was because of his status as a judge that he saw the lack of a maximum deck size as a flaw in the game's design that needed to be highlighted. But according to the man himself, it was all just for the meme. <laughs> on Mega Capital G's video about Mike's massive throbbing deck, Mike commented that the target was to get a smile to other people 
and we reached that target. Mike supposedly filled it with as many cards as possible that would either let him shuffle his deck or find needles in a haystack, so cards in his deck, which would then need to be shuffled. According to him, one game had him playing Green Gadget, a card which has you search your deck for the corresponding Red Gadget card before shuffling your deck. As you can imagine, shuffling a deck of this size is a somewhat of a logistical nightmare, even with this German engineered stand, and he was handed a game loss for taking too long to shuffle after playing Green Gadget. Mike even named this deck Mission Impossible, as Mission is the German word for shuffling, meaning the deck was named Shuffling Impossible in English, which is brilliant, frankly. Seeing that this deck would most likely continue to live up to its name, Mike was given a disqualification in his second game and the 2222 card deck was retired for good. A couple of years later, Konami made the decision to finally implement a maximum deck size, pulling the number down from infinity to a relatively conservative 60. While the timing of this has placed some doubts over whether or not Mike's stunt had any real influence over the situation, the story is much better if we say he did, so I'm just going to lie and say that he was the exact reason for this change. What are you going to do, prove me wrong? Interested in more mini scandals? If you like this, then you should choose between Magic the Gathering scandals or Dungeons and Dragons scandals.